Good afternoon or good morning to some of you. Welcome to IAUSA's advocacy update webinar, what comes next for EB-5 reauthorization. Thank you for joining us. I know it's a really important time for the industry, so we appreciate you taking the time to come and listen to our content. Before we get started, I just wanna run through a few housekeeping items. First and foremost, this webinar is intended for educational purposes only and does not constitute legal advice. We recommend you always consult with your own legal counsel with any questions or concerns on the topic. And the information is in this webinar is deemed to be accurate and up-to-date as of the recording. Um, next, just wanna remind everyone that our participants are in listen-only mode. If you have a question for the panelists, please use the Q&A function. We will be able to get to questions at the end. So if you have questions throughout, feel free to uh, throw them into that Q&A box and we'll try our best to get to as many questions as possible. Um, but at the end, if we haven't answered your question, we do have some email addresses that you can send questions to us um, after the fact. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panelists for today. First, we have Aaron Grau, Executive Director of IIUSA. Next, we have Robert Kraft, CEO of First Pathway Partners and President of IIUSA. We also have Aaron Chichekta, Managing Director at Golden Gate Global and Director at IIUSA. Rush Deacon, Managing Director, Pine State Regional Center and Director at IIUSA. Ishan Khanna, Co-Founder at the American Immigrant Investor Alliance and Daryl Sanders, Managing Director of Investment Programs at American Life. And we also have George McElwee from Commonwealth Strategic Partners who is available for questions if need be. And at this time, I would like to turn it over to IUSA's President, Bob Kraft, to give an opening statement. Bob? Yeah, thank you, Ashley. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody who's on the call here. We appreciate the support, the interest, and we support the, uh, uh, we appreciate the support for IIUSA. Uh, as Ashley mentioned, we were kind of at a inflection point. Certainly all of us are disappointed uh, with what happened uh, recently. Uh, you know, we had companion bills. It's the first time in the history of the industry that we've been able to do that. And the bills uh, were identical, uh, supported by 24 plus members of the house. Uh, and we had strong support in the Senate. Uh, Senator Grassley and Leahy have led the charge and they were joined uh, by Senator Coons as a sponsor. And Senator Cornyn actually went on the floor uh, when the unanimous consent uh, was attempted, which was blocked by one Senator. Uh, the program has widespread support because of the economic impact it's had on this country, on this country since its inception. Uh, the job creation and the opportunity to provide uh, people from all over the world to come to the United States and chase the American dream. Uh, although we were disappointed, uh, dialogue continues. We're very optimistic that even though we have an interruption right now, it's not a matter of if the program will be authorized, it's, it's when, and when in a very short period of time. So today uh, we attempt to answer as many questions as possible, update our membership, on our ongoing advocacy efforts and why we are optimistic about the program and why we feel very confident we'll get this done. So uh, again, I appreciate everybody's support of the association, uh, this group uh, on the call today, plus your board of directors, your leadership group, and the full membership has been very active uh, and engaged in lobbying for a continuation that protects the investors. The integrity reform package is good not only for the investors, but also for the regional center operators that really kind of are the point of the spear, but the ecosystem is, is significant. There are a lot of professional organizations that participate and support uh, and benefit from the program in the country, the economy benefits, and that's understood by Congress. So uh, we're excited about the next steps. We were disappointed, uh, but we're uh, cautiously optimistic about uh, reauthorization in a short period of time here. So thank you again for taking the time to listen today. Thank you, Bob. Uh, I, will, I will pick it up from there uh, and set the stage for our panelists. Uh, the answer to the question, um, what comes next for EB-5 reauthorization is actually pretty simple. I mean, work will continue. We're anticipating meetings being revised um, this week, Thursday or Friday to restart negotiations. 
However, <clears throat> to simply say that overlooks a lot of the context of what we're seeing on Capitol Hill and what IAUSA's position actually is um, and how we're going to advocate those positions. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do is um, lay out exactly that um, and then ask each one of our panelists, uh, given their perspectives, to react to what I'm about to set up uh, and also offer their own uh, perspectives and opinions with regards to the reauthorization effort. So um, Bob did touch on it, uh, and there's really no need, I think, to rehash any more than he did as so far as what happened. On June 24th, one senator objected to uh, the grassley Leahy bill that uh, was supported as uh, equally by uh, Senator Coons and then on the Senate floor by Senator Cornyn. And that one particular objection uh, nullified unanimity and therefore um, we were out of time essentially before the Senate recessed uh, and came back after the June 30th expiration. So <clears throat> looking at that situation, um, IIUSA, which represents 250 plus membership organizations uh, across the country and across the globe. Uh, we represent urban um, uh, interests, we represent rural interests, um, and we certainly have global partners. Um, took a look at the situation and um, quickly realized that hope was not lost. Um, that in fact, despite our size uh, and our reach, there was still work um, uh, that we needed to do. Uh, in particular, I want it to be clear that IIUSA, um, again, despite its size and reach, acknowledges that its constituency is really only part of the EB-5 ecosystem. And the balance also includes investors and their families. And so anything that we do needs to take um, their interests uh, into account as well. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, there won't be an EB-5 regional center program to facilitate if the investors aren't protected um, and supported. So um, with this in mind um, and with that, with that position made clear, um, we're proceeding to work and to build on the success that we established um, early on in 2000. 20 in the beginning of this year. And that success, people have asked me before, what is that success if, if, we, if we have an expiration? Um, that success is reflected in what Bob made clear as well, that there are two bills that are still uh, very much alive. Uh, they have bipartisan support. They reflect each other unequivocally. Uh, and so there is quite a platform on which for us uh, to build. And it's that position that, that will begin the conversations hopefully uh, later this week uh, to get things kickstarted again. So as we engage in those conversations, um, IIUSA's work, its priorities for reauthorization are limited only by pragmatism uh, and political realities. Above all, we need a long-term reauthorization. We need meaningful uh, investor protections and integrity reforms. Those are IIUSA's priorities. Those are the items that we will make uh, most important above all else. Now, after that, uh, it should be clear that we endorse uh, the many other issues that need to be adopted into the program to make it better, not only for regional centers, but for um, investors, uh, not the least of which would be the re-inclusion of judicial review, uh, the possibility of parole entry, derivative relief, decreased processing times, increased visa numbers. I think all of us can agree that these are definitively things that must be included in a bill. However, I'll reflect back again on the pragmatic approach that we need to take. And that is to do the most amount of good for the most amount of people with an acknowledgement that we're not going to get everything um, that we want. What we simply need, what we need to do is get um, everything that we need. And the question then is before all of us as to whether or not uh, these other items are possible in a political atmosphere uh, that is Washington DC now and in the timeline that we have um, between now and let's say the end of the fiscal year, which may be uh, September. So that's the stage in which uh, we're set to play. Uh, conversations beginning later this week 
IAUSA staking a political, a, a pragmatic uh, flag in the ground, seeking long-term reauthorization and investor protections. And I'd like to open it up to our panelists now to get their perspectives on what I've shared, to share their own perspectives um, on the path forward and what comes next for EB-5 reauthorization. And I hope that in that process, we can have an organic conversation as well as begin to field some questions uh, from, from some of our listeners. I will note that um, we have uh, over 400 registrants for this event. Uh, I see there are about 218 or 220 on the, on the line right now. Um, so we may not get to all questions, uh, but we're certainly going to make uh, every effort. So let me do this. Uh, just looking at the screen that I have uh, in front of me, I'll start uh, by asking Rush Deakin for his response. Uh, to what I've laid out and his um, view of the world, especially given um, his rural interests uh, and the rural projects that he represents. Rush, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, uh, thank you, Aaron. And, uh, I, you know, our Arkansas is a rural state and, and our regional center has a rural project as um, that is uh, we have an offering for right now. All we need is a reauthorized program. But um, I, I look at it from a broader perspective because, I mean, we, we have uh, metropolitan areas in Arkansas, just as any state does. And we look at projects that are for the good of the state. We're, we're a mission-driven organization. So obviously, first and foremost is a reauthorization of the program. As you mentioned, Aaron, uh, integrity needs to be part of that. And no one disagrees with that. I, I think that uh, as has often been said, no one objected to, other than with a couple of, of quibbling exceptions, uh, no one objected to what's in the bill, but it was more of what was not in the bill that uh, drew the most uh, criticism and um, the objections that ultimately um, one senator brought to the floor of the, of the Senate. I, I think it, it, you, you mentioned uh, pragmatism and political realities, and that's, that's my touch point is, I mean, we can write our letter to Santa and, and lay out our wish list of all the things that we like under our Christmas tree but we're not going to get everything and, and we have to understand what is politically possible to happen I, I, as we talked about uh, yesterday i mean you could have everyone in the industry all of the industry associations that with all of the alphabet uh, uh letters in their name you could get them to come together and agree on what would be a, a bill that we would all like to see but guess what we don't get to vote we we're not on the floor of the Senate or the House. It comes to the people who are elected that serve in those two bodies that will determine what a bill looks like and what's included in that bill. And so it's been made pretty clear over the last several years as to the hot buttons that are problems uh, and those things that are uh, unanimous in, in, in terms of uh, the whole industry agreeing. Obviously reauthorization of the, of the program everyone agrees on. Integrity as a general concept, no one disagrees with that. Uh, there are some provisions that you noted, Aaron, that, that, that we'd like to see uh, worded differently or eliminated, but uh, overall integrity in the program is a good thing for the reputation of the program, for the protection of investors, and, and uh, for generally. So those two things are without a doubt uh, unquestioned. Those are the things that are in the Grassley-Leahy bill. If there are some things that we might be able to add to that or subtract from that, that would make it a more palatable bill for a more broad audience, um, let's, let's have that discussion. Uh, as Aaron said, uh, negotiations on those points are going to begin as early as this week. So uh, let's, let's have those discussions and, and agree, but keep in the background the knowledge that we have to have be politically, um, we have to have pr be pragmatic, pragmatic in a sense of understanding the political realities of what is likely to pass and what might be a button that's going to keep a bill from passing. So I, I urge everyone in the industry to keep those 
political realities in mind when we start talking about what we'd like to see and, and, and not see in, in a new bill. Thanks, Russ. <clears throat> Ishan, I'd like to go to you next. Um, I credit you with very quickly establishing an advocacy group on behalf of investors. And although the regional center program um, per se, IIUSA, um, doesn't represent investors, certainly the way you do, uh, we and I personally recognize the value that you're bringing to the table, uh, and we're grateful for that. So I'm interested to hear your perspectives as well um, on, on the path forward and, and, and what you may be hearing from your constituents insofar as what's, what's most important. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, appreciate you having me on this. Uh, I think it's been a long time since EB-5 investors were allowed to have a voice uh, when it comes to uh, stuff like this. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. So uh, I just want to make it clear to the investors on the call um, about what happened. You know, uh, just briefly speaking, the reason why we we had a pro we have a program lapse now is because congressional leadership and different factions of the industry could not come to an agreement regarding the future of this program. Now, with that said, and as someone who speaks to the different factions of the industry, I do know that there is a great desire from both sides to work together. So I'm happy to see that. With that said, you know, the lapse, I, I know that it hurts people. I know that there are families which are being torn apart. I realize that there are investors out there who can't let them have their kids go to college. There's investors who are waiting on work authorization, who are stuck in the US without the ability to, ability to work. And, and the impact of that is, is not lost on, on me and I'm, I'm sure with the other panelists right now. So with that said, I, I would wanna let investors know that there is active effort being taken on the different factions and members of the industry that I have personally seen uh, them making efforts to, to help reauthorize this program to ensure that a long-term reauthorization does pass. Um, I know that there's investors out there who are hoping for another short-term reauthorization, just like there's been in the past for so many years. However, I don't think it's a good idea to ask for another short-term reauthorization. You know, having investors get stressed out every few months, waiting to ensure that the visa bulletin doesn't go from a C to a U, it, it, it's stressful. And, and I hope that investors don't have to keep going through that uh, uh, on a short-term basis. So with that said, I have faith in the industry that, that they are doing the right thing. I have faith in the industry that they are coming to a consensus towards what the long-term vision of the EB-5 program looks like. So uh, yeah, that's my uh, two cents on this. Thank you. And I'm confident we'll have some Q&A as we proceed that, that you'll have a unique perspective on. Daryl, can I ask you for your opinion and your, your outlook? I mean, um, you, you obviously represent uh, urban and maybe some suburban interests. Uh, how do things look from your perspective and what are your thoughts on the stage that we've set? Yeah. Um, you can hear me okay. You know, I want to... Uh, American Life has been established since 1996. So we're the oldest regional center program uh, in the country. And during that time, we've had uh, previous occasions, previous pauses um, that have come uh, not just from a legislative side, but, but from court interpretations and USCIS um, pausing the program. In the late 90s, we went through a period of time when the program was not moving forward for you know over a year so you know we've been through not not the same as it is now but we've been through interruptions before um we're confident that we're going to get through this um there's uh organizations primarily iusa and other organizations that are you know are working towards this um the current COVID economic recovery uh, is, you know, EB-5 is ideal for that to help uh, regions and areas and cities get back and going again. Um, we've seen that uh, areas that were not formally TEA are back into a TEA designation uh, due to COVID. Um, you know, our, our hope is that uh, this gives us an opportunity uh, to 
change of dialogue and, and IUSA follows this thought also, which this is an economic uh, program, not an immigration program. And uh, that's really our focus is, as we work to lobby or to communicate or to push for a reauthorization is that this is an economic program with no cost to the taxpayer and a very significant uh, positive outcome for urban or rural communities that embrace this. Our biggest concerns right now um, are our existing investors. Uh, we have a lot of people uh, in, in line uh, that have either not processed, uh, in some cases, even their 526, but a lot of people waiting for visas. And there really has been uh, very little communication from the administration or USCIS on how it's going to be handled. There, there was a, a brief guidance released that uh, encourage people or, or uh, made sure that people were responding to RFEs in a timely manner. So that those were recorded as, as, uh, as responded. But, you know, we're really looking at that. We've got uh, a lot of people that we're concerned about and we're looking for uh, additional guidance on that. We're also looking for uh, AILA uh, to see where the immigration lawyers that represent these investors, what their position is gonna be officially. Um, I have not seen that yet. Um, and of course, we have we have current projects that are on hold. The projects aren't on hold, but the ability for investors to participate uh, is going to be on hold until we get a, a reauthorization. So um, it's early. This just happened. Uh, the, it's as has been said already. Uh, we everybody needs to keep in mind these bills have not gone away. They're still there. They're still being worked on. Um, we, we lost an opportunity, but uh, we're, we're going to stay positive. Uh, I think the biggest difficulty is getting uh, Congress's attention on this. Now that we're not tied to the budget bill, uh, this needs to be looked at independently or possibly tied to some type of a, uh, a larger uh, economic program. And I think that's an ideal place that, that we can look to attach this reauthorization to uh, whether it's infrastructure or economic recovery, something that may be out there in the near future that the administration would support. That's 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 our thought there. Appreciate it, Daryl. And, and I mean, Aaron, last but not least, uh, your perspective is very important. I've been on a phone call with you and your colleague, Stephen Kay, in conjunction with um, Speaker Pelosi's office. You are uh, in her district uh, and have done incredible uh, projects out there. Your perspective on the legislative path forward, uh, what this means to your investors, and any additional comments you have, um, very important. So, over to you. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Aaron, and thank you for this this opportunity. So, a, as you said, we're we're based in San Francisco, California, and Nancy Pelosi's jurisdiction. And um, I mean, I, I want to start with. Um, echoing some of the things that uh, the other panelists mentioned about optimism. And I'm, I'm not an optimistic person, to be honest, in, in general, but um, there is enough kind of evidence right now um, and bipartisan support that this is a matter of when, not if, uh, in terms of reauthorization. And I'm confident about that. Uh, and another reason is that there is no one who wants to block the EB-5 in general. And I think that's important, right? Today, even though we had kind of an um, issue right now, kind of a roadblock as we call it, um, the opposition to the bill and the process came from an angle that does not want less of a program or that, that, that the program doesn't exist, but they want just more of the program, right? To be able to add more bells and whistles. Um, you can argue whether that's realistic or not, whatever, but everybody wants this program to be alive, to move forward, and to be able to uh, reasonably uh, quickly move investors forward. And, and, and that's our goal as well. Uh, from an urban standpoint, obviously, I mean, most all of our projects are urban projects and on the West Coast. Um, we, what, in addition to what Daryl said, I mean, one of our kind of concerns and what we want to make sure continues to happen is to offer the same quality, strong projects to investors. And that's, that's critical because from an urban standpoint, one of the risks is to alienate the 
um, the strong developers, the hard earned confidence of solid, diligent borrowers in the EB5 industry that the investors can trust, can invest their funds in, and, and to be able to make sure those parties still believe in EB5 financing as well. I know we, we like everyone else, or I know that our fellow panelists are just put the investor um, investors process at the, the highest point, but also sometimes it's just forgotten to talk about, well, we have to make sure that the good projects stay in the picture as well. We don't want desperate borrowers. We don't want people who don't, <clears throat> we don't want the strong developers to not to trust EB5 financing and these kind of lapses and these, these kind of extensions constantly happening is impacting that. I mean, if you're a strong borrower, a strong developer, um, and in, a, in, in an area that needs the EB-5 financing, and if you don't trust EB-5, you just walk away, and then the EB-5 opportunities become less and less attractive, at least in the urban areas. And I think that's important, and that's why time is of essence. I mean, we need to resume the I-526 and I-485 I, I, I processing. I, I, I agree with Sean that um, we also would certainly prefer um, a new so, um, sustainable reauthorization of the program over any kind of clean extension, just a few months and keeping this. But at the same time, we also value our investors processes a lot and we would like to be able to resume at least that processing as soon as possible, uh, hopefully, and then to have a sustainable solution to this because we're, we're in it all together. This is our business. Uh, our investors are our highest priority, and we would like to be able to make everyone happy uh, to be able to extend and continue this program as it should be. So those are my points. I mean, a lot of it's already said, but I would love to be able to uh, kind of chime in with the questions as they come in. Thank you. Thank you. Well, perfect. So. Let me reiterate, um, IIUSA, uh, as the industry leader, is fully cognizant that the regional centers are part of the ecosystem that we need to preserve, that investors also have a role in making all of this go and grow. And as we look towards the end of this week and following days and following weeks in uh, negotiations to definitively reauthorize this program, our priorities are pragmatic. Our priorities are taking a hard look at the political tea leaves and we are focused on long-term reauthorization and integrity measures and if there's a political path forward to add any of the other pro, uh, uh, edits uh, to a bill that we also believe are good for the program we will throw our full weight uh, behind behind those changes as well um, so we're at about we're about halfway through and this is exactly where i wanted to be um, i'm going to ask um, uh, Ashley to uh, facilitate the Q&A. And why don't we spend a good half hour on it uh, and answer as many as possible. I think um, the folks here on the panel are, are uh, perhaps uniquely positioned to do so, urban, rural, um, obviously uh, investor. And um, I'll do my best to keep this from being the Aaron Grau show. We have other, other people who are a lot smarter than I am. So Ashley, can you give us maybe the first question uh, that you see and um, we'll do our best to address all of them? Sure. Um, so this first one is a two-parter. Um, first is what is your stand on seeking an interim short-term reauthorization while negotiations continue? And then the second part is, can you please elaborate on steps being taken to forge common ground with EB-5 IC and what is the likelihood of success? I'll kick the answers off, and then I'm going to pick. I'm going to pitch it over. Um, uh, Short-term reauthorization, um, in the absence of any other solution, is obviously something that we need to grasp. But as Ishan pointed out, and I believe others, a short-term reauthorization to simply revisit all of these issues once again um, is not an ideal solution. With regards to outreach to the EB5 IC. Um, I'm definitely going to turn it over to Ishan, and I'm going to credit him with, uh, again, with being a, a, an organization, an individual who's been able to 
have conversations with uh, both IUSA and EB5IC because to date, most of the conversations that we've had with EB5IC have been through uh, congressional staff. And we're looking forward to sitting down with them, hopefully again at the end of the week. But Ishan, any, any perspectives that you have in answering uh, one or both of those questions? Sure. Um, I already kind of gave my position regarding short-term reauthorization and just my personal feelings against it. Um, I, I'll comment on the on the relationship with EB5IC in Common Ground in a second, but I want to take a moment to just talk a little bit about uh, the American Immigrant Investor Alliance and what we're doing also, aside from what IUSA is doing. We ourselves are also engaging in advocacy efforts. And what, what we found, what we are trying to do now is we're also trying to draft up legislative specific legislative language that would ensure grandfathering of existing investors so that we're not you know used as a bargaining chip or or have our application stalled when reauthorization fails the whole issue that i have with short term reauthorization is that it jeopardizes investors every few months and we should not allow that to happen the us government should uphold the contract that we have entered into as immigrants. We made, and I know Daryl earlier said this is an economic program, but to us, to us immigrants, this is an immigration by investment program. We've, when we make our investment, we do it with a good faith that the government will uphold their contract with us, will grant us the green cards if we've done everything correctly. And if, when the government doesn't do that, it's a problem. And so I, I hope that what AIA, AIA is doing is, is able to advocate for EB-5 investors and, is, and ensures that our applications are processed, even if there is a lapse or on the program or the program isn't reauthorized for whatever reason in the future. Now to answer the second part, which is common ground with EB-5IC. Look, I've had conversations with both Aaron and the head of EB-5IC for a while. I mean, they both text me. Um, it's nice to have access to both of them. And you know, I think they see eye to eye on probably 90% of the issues. Uh, I, I realize that the other faction wants a few changes that would benefit existing investors, would also help gain new investors as well. And, and I can also say this, being completely transparent here, if what the other faction wants was to succeed, if it does get included in future bills, everyone on this panel is going to make a lot of money, a lot more money than they do now. So I think it's in. I think we all want uh, some of those uh, wish list items that that the other faction wants. But that said, you know, this is politics. We have to uh, in a, in a February three February third webinar. Uh, Aaron very rightly said there's a difference between good governance and and the grand bargain. We can choose what path to go for. Or we can find a middle ground. So I think that you know both parties are meeting to, together later this week. Let's see how that plays out. Let's stay in touch and figure out what's going on with that. And I think that's the best way to go forward. Now, uh, I also want to quickly, sorry, take this moment to also talk about a plan B in case you know none of this works out. Uh, I would invite the investors on this call to look us up, to go to our website, check out the American Immigrant Investor Alliance. The Alliance is working towards educating senators, members of Congress on the EB-5 program. Just two hours ago, we had a call with Senator Toomey from Pennsylvania, and we spoke to his staff about, you know, who are the main users, the main consumers of the EB-5 program? How are they being affected by this lapse? And the, the truth is, members of Congress don't really know. When you type in EB-5 into Google or whatever else, you're going to see articles talking about this as a cash for visa scheme. It's not. It's an investment. It brings jobs and money to the U.S. economy at zero cost to the American taxpayer. The, the, you, the consumers of the program, especially for the last four or five years, many of them happen to be uh, of South Asian descent. Many of them who are stuck in other e immigrant backlogs have existing immigrant petitions and are now doing EB-5 to secure them and their families a place in American society. And I think at the end of the day, we, I think we're all coming together to, to work together to ensure that immigrants are protected. So uh, yeah, that's all I have to say. That's quite a lot. Um, I'd like to hear from the other panelists, including uh, Chairman Kraft, um, on Europe's observation. Well, obviously, on the question that was asked, um, grandfathering in particular. 
But uh, Ishan, on your observation that in having spoken with EB5 IC and, and, and working with IAUSA that you see that we are seeing eye to eye on 90% of the issues. Um, I agree. Uh, I agree with you. I think there's much more common ground there than, than we're all giving ourselves credit for. The question is what will ultimately be possible? I'm glad you raised the issue. Uh, Bob, I mean, as chairman of the association, what are your thoughts? I mean, you can see why I asked you, Sean, to be on the call. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate his comments. And, uh, you know, as I said in my opening remarks, the, the investor has always been, you know, kind of at the top of the, uh, the pyramid from an IIUSA standpoint. Uh, and it was said by a couple of people that if we don't protect the investor, and, and do the right thing there, then we don't have an industry. The EB-5 coalition and some of the other groups uh, that we've worked with and or may in some cases have some disagreements with, we have been engaged with for a long time. Uh, and we do agree pretty much everything, but uh, again, the reality of what will happen in Congress, you know, perhaps is where we have a little bit of separation uh, we had two bills uh, that were uh, matching, that were supported, uh, and yet it was blocked uh, by one senator who did not answer uh, the question, why are you objecting, and just kind of left the uh, floor. Um, but we're close. And if there was a short-term extension that was put on the table, I, we would prefer to see a long-term authorization. Uh, we, we, our primary objective is to keep the program authorized. So I guess at this point, we're trying to be open to what may come next. Uh, we are supportive of many of the things on the wish list, the Christmas list as uh, Rush talked about, uh, but we're also realistic. And, uh, and I think that's, that reality perhaps will come together in all groups here soon now that we have a lapse in the program. But underlying everything is the fact that there is bipartisan broad support for the program. So, you know, we're gonna keep working hard. Some of the issues that were raised are also really USCIS issues. And I, and I should say that we continue to also work closely with USCIS on processing delays you know, administrative type issues, that's always been uh, high on our list. And, and I think with a new administration with uh, Secretary Mayorkas, uh, we're gonna see some improvements there. He's a, a supporter of EB-5, which is great for us. There are some other people that uh, have joined the group, uh, the administration in, in Homeland Security, that are very supportive, that recognize they need improvement in that area. So, you know, we're not, doing just one thing. I mean, we're kind of working broadly on behalf of the industry in all the areas that affect the ultimate delivery of a quality outcome for the investor, for regional centers, for professional organizations. And we're just going to keep fighting. And hopefully we can find common ground with uh, the other groups in the industry and, and most importantly with Congress and get something done here shortly. Ashley. What do we have next? Um, next one, can HR 2901 get voted on in the House without committee hearings? Has the committee hearing been completed? When would the bill be voted on? We have our lobbyist, George McAwee on the call. Um, George, you mind fielding that one real quick? Sure, uh, I would say one, that we're, we would normally say that that would be part of regular order. We're not gonna see um, probably this bill come up through the Judiciary Committee and then be voted on. Yes, there are ways that a bill can actually be discharged from the committee and go straight to the floor, but we don't see that as, as a way of moving forward. This, whatever proposal that we have, HR 29 or one or even SA 31 in the Senate, uh, would most likely need to now at this point probably be attached to something, something else. And that's what we'd be looking for. Thank you. What's I'll, uh, I'll move to this next question, which is probably another one for George while he's uh, while he's awake here. Um, uh, is there a strong interest amongst IUSA and the EB-5 community that the EB-5 program can play an integral part in Biden's infrastructure plan? 
I mean, I think what we're doing, a lot of it is infrastructure. So we can look across the country and some of the development projects that are be, is being used for. I think that the a Biden infrastructure plan, um, especially some of the ones that have come out and the bipartisan uh, bills that, that have been introduced, I think it could be utilized there. Uh, but we also see that as a potential vehicle for us to attach the bill to if needed. Uh, right now, I'm not too sure what, and I don't think Congress really has a uh, I think they want to move quickly on infrastructure, uh, but I know that we also probably want to move a little more quickly than they do to get our program reauthorized. So it could be an option for us to tag along to, uh, but I don't I don't know if it would necessarily be something that we would be uh, it would be written into the law itself, other than just attaching the language if it were to come up to the floor. Um, Rush, Aaron, Daryl, any any comments on the infrastructure idea? When I uh... When I mentioned earlier about this being an economic program, um, I, I think that's where the appetite for Congress will be. So, you know, we promote this uh, to con the congressional offices as an economic program. My hope is that it will get attached to an infrastructure or an economic recovery type of bill. Um, I don't see it coming up as a pure immigration uh, related bill or policy bill um, in, in the near future. I think our direction is to look to uh, something else we can hang this to. Um, the size of the bill, while it's, it's, it's huge to everybody on this call, it, it's not big it, within the world of what Congress is looking at right now. So one of the risks we have, one of the, the difficulties is just getting enough attention to it to move it along when there's so much time being used on other issues. So attaching it to infrastructure or to another economic program, I think is gonna be the vehicle to get this through in a reasonable period of time. What do we got next, Ashley? Or Russ, did you want to say something? I saw your. your... No, I, I agree with Daryl. I mean, it, you, you've got to find something to attach it to that's a, you know, essentially must pass legislation or that has bipartisan support um, to go through the committee process and floor vote. And that, that's time consuming and difficult. I think our best option is to uh, ride on some bill, an infrastructure bill would be uh, one of those uh, good possibilities with good synergies. All right, Ashley, All right. what's next? Next question. Can someone identify the specific hot button, hot button issues that IAUSA considers not possible in a pragmatic bill that can pass in today's political reality? When it comes to these issues, where's the disagreement with the other side? A difference in opinion about the political reality or a different level of risk tolerance in pushing for much wanted provisions with a low chance of passage? Well, this will be an interesting one for the panelists. So uh, if, if I rephrase it, just to keep it simple for everybody, what are the hot button issues that we may agree on, but that IIUSA sees as just really difficult to fit into a reauthorization bill and still have a reauthorization? Um, I'll open it up. What panelist wants to take it first? Well, I'll jump on one. Uh, you know, the big one is more visas. Um, you know, when, when we started, there was half a dozen regional centers and now there's, you know, as, as many as, you know, over 800. So uh, this limited uh, visa availability is what creates not only the long backlog, but the market conditions themselves. And so, you know, we, we, we our, our wish list is to have more visas, but to bring that into a congressional discussion uh, would uh, you'd not only be uh, debating additional immigration to the United States, you, but you'd be up against other groups that have other economic interests that revolve around immigration that would also want a bite at any additional visas and would resist giving any up. So, you know, that's, that's really a huge one that uh, people have on their list and is often included in these discussions or with competing ideas, but it would be difficult to get uh, a reauthorization if that was part of it. Yeah, I, I agree with Daryl. I mean, I, I think that uh, when you're talking hot button, you're not talking about where IUSA might uh, agree or disagree with any other uh, EB5 IC or whoever. I think we all, we'd all love to have more visas. We all have to love to see an expansion of the program. And we all hope that we can get there. And I think we can at some point in the future, but to try to get a uh, additional visas on a reauthorization of the program at this point, I think is 
uh, politically um, unrealistic. And um, so I, I think that that's clearly one of them. I mean, you've got other hot button issues that different uh, senators care about, um, but I, 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 I think more visas is the clear answer of one of those that we'd all love to have, but we have to be pragmatic and, and save that for another day. Well, just to add to that, I mean, another one, I think that's, that, that has been discussed many times over, even, even throughout this, these discussions with uh, um, Grassley and Leahy's offices as well as the parole entry, right? Uh, which is by itself, it's actually a gr great idea, addresses the backlog uh, for the most part for a lot of the Chinese investors that are currently waiting for like over 10 years could be able to kind of grant them access through uh, a temporary visa or some sort of a bridge vehicle as they call it, the parole entry uh, to, to get them over. Uh, but that was pushed back uh, by by the during the conversations as well. So there are a lot of good ideas. There are a lot of things that could make this program more sustainable um, soon. But again, the, the political environment, the, the the kind of structures of of how immigration is is in, in general kind of design um, uh, create a lot of problems and and issues. And as as, as my fellow panelists mentioned that. I mean, it, is it realistic or not? It just comes down to that. Whether it's it's, are, 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 can we kind of get these through with all our wish lists or not? Apparently not. So that's why the expectations need to meet the realities, and we have to find that middle ground to push this forward. Because again, I mean, this this list can go long. And Aaron, I know you you worked on this really diligently. Uh, and you can name all these hotspots, but I mean, we we gone through pretty much all of them over and over again. And the bill that was just kind of introduced and could not pass was the kind of the the agreed upon point with at least Grassley and Leahy's offices. So that's that's what we are. That's the realities of it. We have to understand. We have to continue fighting, but the realities are. Really Ishan, oh, yeah, I actually wanted to say too, when we talk about the hotspots, I think we then sometimes focus on what Grassley and Leahy say don't want in a bill. But I would, you know, we have done countless meetings on the Hill. And a lot of times it's not just Grassley and Leahy or others that have come up, but others have objected to including things too. So it's really members of Congress that have objected to these. So it, as someone I think Rush said too, it's not really hotspots that we have or disagreements we have with other industry groups. Uh, it's what we actually, it's what we're trying to do is, is trying to find a way forward. And in finding that way forward, we have to be working with the members of Congress, those that are actually voting on the bill at the end of the day. We're not the ones voting. So we have to work with them and so we're seeing across the board that there are different things that, are, that one, are supportive of, but then also are not supportive of. So sometimes when we bring in other, uh, other topics or other issues, we start losing support in other areas. And so we'll lose members of Congress and they'll fall off because of what we're bringing to the table. So we're really trying to forge that, you know, we're the ones building the bridge and saying, what can we be doing one to make sure that we're having a program that we can actually move to move forward with I would always, you know, some of the, one of the conversations I had uh, when we're having meetings on the Hill and we were really coming up again that, against that deadline. So whether it was 30 or 25 days or 15 days, I'd say, you know, I'd rather have, you know, the 1,825 five-year reauthorization would give me than the 15 days that I have right now that I'm staring at when the program expires, which it has to expire. So I think we need to make sure that we're, when we're talking about some of these hot, or it's just something that Grassley and Leahy have said that they want to, that they wouldn't submit to, it's other members of Congress as well. Ishan, I'm interested in your answer to the question as well. Uh, we're moving forward. Um, we will have these negotiations. I'm not going to ask you to speak on behalf of IUSA, but what, in your opinion, and speaking with investors, are the poison pills? You know, what, what, what are the hot button issues that are really going to derail this conversation? So. Take the time, help shape the conversation. What are your thoughts? Sure. Um, well, I'll start with some criticism from, for IUSA, uh, which you guys already know about, and I know that you fought on behalf of this. Uh, in the previous Glassy Leahy bill, there was a provision 
uh, for investors, but they, there was a, essentially a lack of judicial review. What it basically entailed was that any investor who had his petition denied be forced to go through the Office of Administrative Appeals before being able to approach the U.S. court system. I feel like that is something that is a total poison pill. Um, us immigrants, we've come to the U.S. because our love for this country, because our respect for the American court system. Not being able to utilize it if our petition was denied is, is I feel like, is a bit of a slap on the face. So uh, I would hope that future bills do not include that provision. On the EB-5IC side, there's a couple of provisions that they've mentioned, which you know we like. Uh, there's a few we're not sure how they would be implemented because some would end up negatively affecting investors in line, specifically one called visa set-asides. By definition, visa set-aside means that an, an, uh, an investor, if they invest in a visa set-aside project, would be able to take a visa that it was meant for someone else. And with the limited number of visas EB-5 gets every year, this, this program gets every year, I feel like all of that should go to investors in line. Um, other than that, there were some, there were specific provisions that we like. For example, grandfathering of existing EB-5 petitions, like I mentioned earlier, uh, the integrity measures, some of them would actually help prevent fraud. Now, the one measure, which I think that the entire industry should get behind, which I think will positively benefit investors in line, as well as prospective investors who wish to come to the US on EB-5, is premium processing. Uh, look, uh, no one wants to invest in EB-5, invest half a million or a million dollars and have to wait two, three, four years to be able to move to the US or gain permanent residency. I, I think that premium processing, having a fixed time with uh, having the investors pay a fixed amount to US their petitions to be approved, whether it's three months, six months, or a fixed, essentially a fixed timeline, I think would benefit all investors. In fact, would make this program attractive. You know, I'm, I'm a foot soldier. I, I speak with EB-5 investors on a daily basis, prospective EB-5 investors. And many of them are comparing EB-5 with other golden visa programs or other immigration by investment programs anywhere else in the world. And in comparison, the greatest country on this planet cannot even process petitions in a timely fashion. And I think it's kind of disgusting. So I think that one thing that would positively benefit everyone, including USCIS, is allowing investors to pay a fee in order for their petitions to be approved in a quicker fashion. So any panelists, want, any panelists want to react or should we go to the next question in the minutes we have left? Yeah, could I, Aaron, could I just say, I, I like everything Sean just said. I do too. He cut the chase. Yeah, we're in agreement. Ashley, what do we have next? Well, we're getting close on our time here. So I'm gonna ask this one um, because if it takes a little bit of time, I think it's a good one to close out on. Are you comfortable giving a timeline when you foresee a reauthorization? Hmm. Or that is a tough one. <laughs> Call in the curtains. Come I'm on here. back away. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I love our goal is to have it as soon as possible. I mean, I think that's where we, that's what we're, but we're challenged by what's the, the congressional calendar as well. Uh, we need to have our negotiations and really talk and to make sure that we have uh, individuals that are willing to take this, um, you know, all the way for us. But then also we, we do have a limited congressional calendar. And I kind of always lean on the House calendar to kind of give me some guidelines because the Senate always says they're in session, but we don't actually know if they're really in session or not. So really, if you're looking at the House calendar, uh, they've got two weeks here this month, uh, so the month of July where they're in session. And then they have two months in September, the final two months of September where they're in session as well. Um, now that may change. Uh, there has been a lot of discussions on the Hill about trying to see what the calendars, they may be adding a week uh, to the September schedule. So that would be helpful to us. But for us, I mean, we're, we're, we're having meetings you know, every day. We had meetings yesterday with judiciary staff. We're really talking to them on House side, on the House side. Uh, we're looking forward to having our meetings coming up in the Senate as well. We're, we're, we're moving. We're trying to do what we can and we're not, we're not sitting on our hands. We have a few minutes left. Um, there's no way we'll get to all of the questions. Ashley, is there a way we can capture all of them, answer the questions and post the answers on our blog? Uh, yeah, we will have these. Um, if you have specific questions, um, actually slip, go over to this slide real quick. 
Um, you can certainly feel free to email us your questions. Um, there were several questions about processing times and uh, what we're doing to try and improve those. So um, there were some dupli duplicative questions that we were not able to get to. Um, so we can certainly look at these and, uh, and, and answer them after the fact. Okay. Um, um, before we get to our final slide, which I'm anxious to get to, um, which underscores the optimism that we all share for sure. Um, I want to thank the panelists for taking the time to be here. It was a little bit of uh, late notice and I know that you guys have day jobs. And so I'm very grateful for all of you and your perspective and what you represent. Um, particularly grateful to Ishan and the Alliance. Um, you want to give a quick plug? I think, at, in my estimation, the stronger your organization gets, the stronger our organization gets. So do you want to give a, a quick plug about the Alliance, and then we'll, we'll wrap up? Thank you, and I appreciate that. Um, so to reiterate, we, the American Immigrant Investor Alliance, we are a 501c4 nonprofit. We are based out of D.C., and we're doing a lot of active advocacy on the Hill. This is separate from any industry body. Our goal is to educate members of Congress on who the consumers, the main investors are in this program. We feel that there's a massive negative perception, both in the media, as well as Congress about this program. People see this program as being corrupt as only for the wealthy when it's furthest thing from the truth. Uh, just today, I, when I was on the call with uh, Senator Toomey's office, uh, we had on Dr. Tumnala, who is a frontline worker. He, him and his wife uh, are, are both been residents of Pennsylvania for a while. They have kids who go to school there. They were frontline workers. They helped COVID patients. They stayed up late every single night working with them. And they invested in EB-5 in the end of 2018. They've been waiting three years for their immigration benefit, even longer in the EB-2 EB3 line. And I feel like those investors truly represent what is the best of this industry. They represent the best of what makes America great, diversity and immigrants. Uh, tr truly, I feel that, that our cause is just, and I encourage all investors to check out our website, sign up for our advocacy form. We're doing calls on a weekly basis. Even after reauthorization, we're going to be pushing for things that benefit investors. We're going to push for lower processing times. We're going to push for asking for liaison with USCIS. So we can directly communicate with them about petitions and things like that. So join us, join us in this fight. We're not stopping even after reauthorization. We're going to ensure that investors, uh, you know, get the, meet their goals. They get their immigration benefit and they're able to get their money back at the end of the investment term. So, you know, join us in the fight. I'll, I'll see you guys on the website. That's my plug. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you, panelists, once again. You want optimism? I'll give you optimism. Ashley, what's our last slide? And do you want to go ahead and wrap up for us? Sure. So I wanted to remind everyone or possibly inform you if you haven't seen the communications that we are planning to be in Orlando this October for the 11th annual EB-5 Industry Forum. We're so excited to be able to return in person programming and networking. Um, it's gonna be a great event. We're actually holding it at the GW Marriott um, in Orlando, which is an EB-5 project. So if you have not done so already, I encourage you to go to the website you see there on your screen and register. Um, it's gonna be a great event. We're gonna be just so happy to see everybody in person after two years since we were last in Seattle. So that is all I have. Aaron, do you have anything else that you want to say before we get off the line here? No. I, I think we I think we covered it all, and I think yeah. I can Aaron and on two uh, words it would be pragmatism and optimism. Bob, yeah, and if I could, I mean uh, earlier uh, uh, someone asked a question of, uh, about a prediction when this thing is going to reauthorize. I will make a prediction that at the October gathering we'll be celebrating the re reauthorization of the program. It'll be a great time to talk about what we need to do next to address processing times and all the other things that have been discussed. So uh, I will go on the record making that prediction. So go to Orlando and hopefully uh, we'll see everybody there and we'll be celebrating the reauthorization of this program. Thank you all. Appreciate your time today. Have a productive day and I'm sure we will talk to you soon. This won't be the last seminar we offer. Take care.